Here are two passages in the Bible from two men instantly of the same name. Yeshua, uh, bar Yahweh, uh, said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. You've heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. His namesake, Yeshua bar Nun, the Old Testament, uh, a couple, about a thousand years prior to this, uh, this is what uh, the Bible has to say about him. Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country, the Negev, the lowland, the slopes, and all their kings. He left none remaining but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. So what is this command that the Lord God gave? Well, it's all over the Pentateuch, but here's uh, one particular summation of it in Deuteronomy 7. Moses says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away from you seven nations before you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. So if you feel a little uncomfortable reading that text, then that's good. It means your moral intuitions are working properly. If you don't feel uncomfortable, then that's a little concerning. But let's try to move past a sort of general unease into a specific problem. So I have here four premises that, um, when taken together, seem to be in tension. Now, for our logic choppers in the room, they're not logically contradictory, they, so don't, don't, you know, don't logic chop me to death. But let's, uh, they're supposed to be intuitive. So first, God good. And by this, we mean that God is essentially good. Not just he happens to be good, but his very nature is good. And a corollary to this is that he cannot issue an evil command. Second is Bible true. Bible 100% accurately represents God's character and his actions in history. Three, genocide bad. Self-explanatory. Four, Bible genocide. The Bible says that God commanded genocide and that Joshua successfully carried out that command. Okay? So, if you think about these for a second, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it, you can't have all four of them. Either God issued an evil command, the Bible's not giving us an accurate picture of Jesus, or sorry, accurate picture of God, um, genocide actually isn't that bad, or maybe the Bible doesn't say genocide, but you can't have all four of them. So, you got to get rid of at least one. I want you to think for a couple seconds here about the ramifications of rejecting each one of these. So think about what happens if you get rid of one, what happens if you get rid of two, et cetera. Okay? It's on your handout too if you wanna if you can't see the slides. Okay, so we're gonna do some discussion time. I'm going to very uh, forcefully enforce the 10 second rule for those that are in the know. Okay, so what would be the ramifications if number one is rejected? What's the fallout, if you will? Yes. Christianity is dead, and we would have killed it. Okay. Anybody else want to offer? Can Christianity survive if God is not good? survives if God is not good. Okay, yeah, that one's, okay. Is 10 seconds rule still in play? Did you have a comment on well, number one? could you just say goodness is defined by God, so whatever he says is good is good? That would just be to affirm one. You're not rejecting one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's move to number two then. What if we reject that the Bible is true or authoritative, however you cash it out? In other words, it's not giving us an accurate picture. Yes. That the Bible was mistranslated or we lost whatever meaning it had in context. Okay. That, that is possible, but that's really get it, getting at number four, which is um, what does the Bible say? Here we're saying, no, we've read the Bible correctly, and it does say genocide, and it's just wrong about that. That's, that's what we're getting at. So, what happens if, you re if we reject that the Bible is true or authoritative? Yes, Mr. Blackman. We would have to say something like, uh, maybe there is a core to the Bible, but um, Jewish propaganda uh, from that time slipped in between its pages, and we have to you know, okay. cherry pick a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we no longer have any grounding for the Let, faith. Yeah, let me put it this way. How do we know God good? 
Right, so it seems like, ooh, that's gonna be a bit of a problem if we start undercutting that. All right, number three, what are the ramifications if we say genocide is not actually all that bad? Perfect time, perfect timing to join this conversation. So what if genocide actually isn't bad? <laughs> What, what, what's the ramification there? Oh, please get a handout. Um, you'll, you'll definitely need, you'll definitely need one. Okay. Did you, were you gonna say something? I might get kicked out of the university. <laughs> it's, a, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Worst things have happened. Okay, all right, you're, you're paused. Yes, Mr. Blackman. Fair to say that all of our moral instincts are completely up in the air if something mm -hmm. that we would so <coughs> instinctually, so deeply say as genocide could possibly be good, then I think all of our moral instincts just have to be thrown out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember when I said I don't think anyone survives? Go back to that one. <laughs> okay. Pretty, pretty bad. So that one's also pretty bad. All right. Now let's go to number four. What if, upon further inspection, it turns out that this violence in the Bible isn't genocidal violence, and it's not actually genocide? What would be the ramifications of that? It might affect how we read the Bible as a whole. Do you have a comment? Katie has a comment? No. OK. <laughs> well, it seems, it seems like that's probably, yeah. So of these four, number four probably seems like the least uh, fallout, right? The least problematic if we get rid of it. Um, number one, it seems like number one is the most crucial, right? If we get rid of one, then things are really bad. Two and three, we really don't want to give up on them, but we can, might see a little bit of wiggle room in there, right? Okay, so... Um, my goal tonight is not necessarily to data dump a whole bunch of new information about this specific topic. Um, what I really want to do is kind of treat this more as a case study in, um, hey, can you get a handout? You'll need it. <laughs> you'll, you'll definitely need it. I want to use this more as like a case study for how to think about difficult ethical issues, particularly in the Bible and specifically in the Old Testament. So basically what I'm going to do today is applicable far beyond just the immediate application. So there are three toolboxes that we're going to cover, and these toolboxes will help us build a solution to the problem. The first toolbox is triage, and that's what we just did. This is a uh, metaphor that comes from the medical world. Um, it's essentially how, for example, like nurses in the ER discern uh, which patients have the more severe condition. So for example, if you have a guy that walks in the ER and says, ouch, I broke my arm, and another guy comes in with a gunshot wound, who's getting attention first? Yeah, the gunshot guy, right? So both of them need attention, but one of them is much more severe. Second is context, right? Okay, everyone knows this one. Ah, you're taking that out of context. All right, we'll get to that one. And then the last one is retrieval. And retrieval is using the wisdom of the past. So Christianity's been around for about 2,000 years, and in that time period, there have been great thinkers that have thought deeply about these issues. And not only have they thought deeply, but they've contributed to the conversation, and that conversation has then been picked up in subsequent generations. So whenever, this is something very important about biblical interpretation. When you're reading the Bible, you're not actually just reading it by yourself. You might think that you are, but you're not. You're engaging in a communal activity, for those of you that are Christians, I should preface that. If you're a Christian reading the Bible, you're engaging in a communal interpretive activity that goes back 2,000 years. And who you choose to interpret the Bible with will affect how accurately you're able to understand it. So when we go back in the past, think about it not as, oh, I'm wondering what like Augustine has to say about this, or Hilary of Poitiers, or Gregory of Nyssa. No, think about it like I'm reading the Bible with Augustine in the same way that I read the Bible with my friends. And I want to get what his insights are, just like I want to get what um, my friend's insights are. And the thing is, you may think, oh, no, I just read the Bible by myself. No, you don't. Because you all absorb, everybody absorbs cultural context and history that's in your head. You bring presuppositions and baggage to the text. And the question isn't, am I going to bring baggage to the text? It's, am I going to bring baggage to the text knowing what it is and correcting for it? 
or am I going to bring baggage to the text and presuppositions being blind to it and just assuming that whatever I read right off the face of the text is um, exactly what it says in all cases. So that's the idea of retrieval, is going back and saying, I don't have to do this on my own. I can't do it on my own. It's impossible to be intellectually disconnected from uh, the Christian tradition. So we're going to retrieve wisdom from the past to help us answer this question. Okay. So we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail. All right. So first, triage. So like I said, this is used in the medical world. There's uh, a collection of really funny uh, signs from um, this uh, urgent care center called Bay Care. So my favorite one is at the bottom. If you hit your finger with a hammer, you go to urgent care. If you hit your finger with a hammerhead shark and it gets bit off, then you're going to go uh, to emergency care. <laughs> Different scenario. Okay. So another way to kind of mix metaphors is to find which doctrines are hills worth dying on versus things that are agree to disagree. And there are multiple applications outside of this. What it's helping us do in this particular uh, application is triage is helping us identify where is this objection, like what, what does it put pressure on? And we, and we see now, okay, it's putting pressure on the goodness of God, the authority of the Bible, and um, our uh, moral intuitions about the dignity of persons and the evil of genocide. That's where it's putting pressure in our doctrinal system. You can also talk about it in other ways, which is, okay, this person, uh, claims to be a Christian, but we disagree on this particular issue. Is this disagreement cause for us to dissociate? And is this cause for us to not fellowship together as Christians? Triage helps us identify which of those doctrines are doctrines like, no, we're Christians, we'll fight together on this doctrine. For example, the resurrection of Jesus. As Paul says, if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain. So that's a top rank issue. But issues like, you know, the age of the earth, like, who cares, really, you know? That's not going to divide uh, Christians. It does, unfortunately, but it shouldn't. So that's a lot of other applications. Um, and then sometimes you have people that encounter objections to the Christian faith and think that every objection means, oh, I have to decide between being a Christian or not. Oh, no, there's a difference between the number of chariots in Solomon's army between, or sorry, the number of horses in Solomon's stable and Kings and Chronicles. Oh, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, right? Obviously, not a good use of uh, triage there. So what we've done, to loop it back to what we're doing here, sorry, I'm riffing a bit. Um, to loop it back here, we've got three doctrines under consideration. And the question is, which one of these is the hill to die on versus which are ones that we might can negotiate a bit or maybe reconsider? And um, I think that the result would be that the goodness of God is our non-negotiable. Okay. Does anyone disagree with that? Does anyone have questions about triage in general? You guys are on the 10 second rule. Okay, Katie. <laughs> so when you try to figure out which doctrines, like let's say somebody just throws you an issue or baptism or yeah. um, uh, yeah, like how do you decide? How do you figure out what doctrines are critical, especially if yeah, there's great it question. seems really complicated or different people have different definitions? Yes. So triage is not something that you just do immediately. It's, it's an iterative process. What we did just now, whenever I asked all of you, okay, what's the ramifications of these things? That's the first step in triage. Um, but you should also give it a lot. That tells you where you are right then and there. What's important to me? But that doesn't necessarily say that's what's important to every, uh, objectively important. So um, there's a great book. It's recommended at the bottom, Finding the Right Hills to Die On by Gavin Ortland. And he has sort of a process for this. And his process is, OK, first of all, how clear is this issue in the Bible? Like, does the Bible say it over and over and over again? Secondly, how important is it directly to the gospel message itself? Thirdly, and this is actually where we get into retrieval, how has the church considered this? Right? So how has the church viewed this issue historically? Have great thinkers of the faith disagreed about this issue, or have they all been united? The resurrection is a good example, like a very non-controversial example, because every Christian throughout all time, in all places, has affirmed the resurrection. The Trinity would also be one of those central things, because the church got together, wrote a document, and said, this is what God is, and if you don't affirm this, then you're not a Christian. And so that carries a lot of weight uh, towards that. It doesn't make it. Um, it doesn't, in virtue of that, make it uh, an essential issue, but it does that. Uh, so those are like a couple, of, uh, a couple of guides there. Something like the age of the earth doesn't matter to any of those things because the church fathers had radically different views on Genesis. It's not at all obvious from the Bible how old the earth is, um, and it literally doesn't matter to the gospel message, right? 
So that would be one of those things. I, I'm going to pause for a second for any other one, anybody else who has comments. Yes, Audrey has a comment. So that was part of our discussion there, um, and it seems like the goodness of God, it's, those are very much interrelated because the way that we know that God is good is through his self-revelation, right? Um, but it does seem, but I will say that historically, though, Christians have disagreed on this. And I'll actually give you, I'll give you a quote real quick, actually, from Oregon. Um, we'll get to Oregon in a bit. But he has this. He says that we have to be careful in the way we interpret the Bible so as not to lead the simpler of those who claim to belong to the church, believe indeed that there is none greater than the creator in which they are right, but believe such things about God as would not be believed of the most savage and unjust of men. So basically what Oregon is getting at is that it is better to recognize that God is good and to say, I don't understand how this passage in the Bible corresponds to the goodness of God because I'm more certain about the goodness of God than I am about my particular understanding of, of this verse. And Oregon's concern is we don't, uh, as a pastor, he's speaking to like other, other Christians uh, and leaders, saying we don't want the members of our flock to just read the Bible uninformed um, and come to these conclusions about God that are just so horribly savage and, and unjust. And so that's where Oregon, just as a preview of where we're going, he would say it's better to, um, it's better to sort of modify the way we understand the authority of the Bible than it is to uh, lead Christians to believe things that are horrifying about God. That's basically like where that's, that's coming from. But that's, that's what, what, I, um, what I think. You may not agree with that, and that's fine, because what part of triage is also deciding what is a hill for you personally to die on. Because my hills are different than your hills, and then everybody else's hills are different. It's only sort of, like I said earlier, through that communal activity of engaging together that we can converge on kind of what those actually are. OK. I have to, I'm a little short on time. Is it important? OK. All right. So let's put uh, our results. So the results from triage is we're going to put a lock on number one. No touch. OK? That's the results. All right, so now the next um, category we have is context, all right? And oh, this is a good one. This is fun. All right, so we're going to bring our friends Alvin the Atheist and Carol the Christian. All right? So, yeah. Um, yes. So Alvin, Alvin and Carol are, are sort of, uh, I don't know, Socratic dialogue stand-ins, whatever. So Alvin, this, this happens a lot in sort of atheist Christian dialogue or skeptic Christian dialogue, where a skeptic will say something to the effect of, you know, the Bible says that God just drowned a bunch of people or killed a bunch of people or something terrible. And the response is, oh, you're just taking that out of context, right? Knee jerk, out of context. And here is a wonderful response taken directly from one of our friends at the Secular Student Alliance. I thought it was such a good quote. I had to put it in here. He said, I do not concede the point about biblical contradictions or difficulties in general being a result of lack of context. I read a verse about how God loves everyone, and you Christians just love it. But if I read a whole damn chapter about God slaughtering an entire civilization, you just say, ooh, it's out of context. He didn't say it like that. I'm interpreting. <laughs> but I think that's accurate, right? Okay? So, here's... That's, I think that captures the frustration, but I'm going to give a little bit more of a specific translation that we can, um, a little bit more precise statement. So here's how, what I understand his concern to be. I think he's saying that you're using context in an intellectually dishonest way. If a verse sounds good on its own, you don't actually care about its context. Um, but if a whole chapter sounds bad, you just assume that it's out of context before you even know what the context is. In other words, you're starting with the conclusion before you evaluate the data to determine if it is actually good or bad, which I think is a, that's a good corrective. Okay. So here's where Carol takes that point, mulls on it, and says, you know, you're right, that people wrongly use context as a sort of magic wand to just make difficult questions go away. Just add enough context. Context is that thing that when added to the problem, it makes it go away. However, we do need to be sure that we are discussing the right question and proper use of context, 
helps us to understand the question before we try to answer it. And sometimes proper context will raise new questions that we didn't even consider in the first place. All right? So this is, this is what I want to be clear about, is that the use of context is not to solve the problem, it's to understand the problem. If you use context exclusively to solve the problem, you're weaponizing it. Now, it is true that sometimes context will cause problems to go away. Sometimes they'll change them entirely. But if you're using context in an intellectually honest way, then you just have to let the chips fall where they may and deal with, uh, deal with that result. And that goes for both sides. If the problem evaporates, let it evaporate. If it gets worse, let it get worse. But anyway, neither here nor there, all right? So here is the context, uh, what, we, what I mean by this, OK? And here's the big problem with confronting Old Testament uh, controversies in general, is that our discussions of ancient ethics are hindered by category errors, specifically by the 21st century American context that we bring uh, and the baggage that we bring to certain terminology. So for example, if I say the word slavery, immediately most of us are thinking, oh yeah, that's the Civil War. That's you know, black people, uh, Africans being you know, brought over here uh, on the transatlantic slave trade. That's you know, the Civil Rights era, Jim Crow, all of that, uh, racial problems that we have today, all of that's bound up in the term slavery. None of that is involved in what the Bible talks about slavery in the Old Testament with the Hebrews. It's not what's None of that context is relevant in the New Testament with the Romans. It's not even relevant uh, in um, non-European forms of slavery either. So it's actually, um, it's a very Euro, it's America-centric, but even more specifically a Eurocentric way of thinking about that term. So if we just evaluate the term slavery in the Bible uncritically and bring to it all of those issues, then we're not giving it the proper context. Same with the term sexuality. Most of the context, most of the discussion that we have today in the contemporary discourse is shaped by the sexual revolution of the 1960s, is shaped by LGBTQ issues, queer theory, things like that. For example, the concept of a gender identity, even, even the concept of way, the way that we speak about gender and gender identity and male and female and all of that is shaped very much by philosophers uh, from the 20th century. So when we try and go back and read ancient literature, we can't necessarily map onto that. And now we come to the term that is crucial for tonight, which is the word genocide. And I'm sure that most of you probably thought about the Holocaust. That is like the number one issue. And for good reason, because the word genocide was developed in the 20th century. In, like it first was written in a book and developed in 1944 uh, by a Polish lawyer specifically to categorize the Holocaust and, quote, other similar like atrocities. So it's shaped, the word itself is shaped in view of the Holocaust. And so the question is, can we import the categories of the Holocaust into this ancient event. Now, we have, to do, we have to do this. I don't want to do it, but we have to do it. We have to talk about what the word genocide means. So just bear with me. We need to talk about it. Because everybody talks, they throw this word around a lot. Okay? Some people will look at something like this. I don't know if you can see. This is a grid of several uh, characters in Hollywood that have been recast from being redhead to being uh, African American or black, or um, Latino. And they go, no, it's white genocide. They're erasing the white race. No. Which is, of course, ridiculous, right? This is, this is trivial, OK? On the other hand, you have uh, people. Now, I originally wrote this slide like several months ago. You have people that say, oh, no, Russia's invading Ukraine. It's genocide. Look at all the, uh, the chaos over here. And then some helpful gentleman on Twitter pops up and says, Oh, actually, no, sorry. I got this out of the order. And I, I wrote that uh, about the Russia-Ukraine thing. And then literally today, this, these posters were on campus saying no US funding for genocide, because Israel's committing genocide on Palestine. That's the position of the poster. And the US is funding it. So they're using this word genocide, right? And OK, well, it's warfare. That's a little bit closer. And then anytime you say that, some very helpful person, usually on Twitter, will pop up and say, um, actually, technically, even though they are beheading children and shooting phosphorus gas and all of these other things, it's not actually genocide, because according to the UN, it doesn't fit Article 2.A. And it's like, OK, I just saw a decapitated person on Twitter. I don't care about the UN definition, right? So these are the two extremes we want to avoid. We don't want to be like a trivializer and say everything is genocide. We don't want to be a nuanced bro and be like, um, actually, technically, OK? So we're not going to go that way. 
Um, and that's why I don't use the word genocide. I don't think it's very helpful to actually rules lawyer and say, did this particular ancient vet event meet this particular definition right here that the UN decided on in the 20th century? Because that commits the same error that we're trying to get away from, which is bringing the baggage, like getting rid of the baggage that we bring to this context. This is just doubling down and saying, nope, not only are we going to bring baggage, we're going to impose this framework on these ancient texts. So I don't think it's helpful. Now, if you are interested in this, uh, resource number three on the recommended reading does have a long chapter devoted to did Joshua's conquest meet the conditions of UN genocide and says no, if you're interested in that. I am not interested in that. So I'm not going to go down that route. All right? So come back to context. So when I've been talking about context, we're I've been using a lot of uh, terms about like bringing baggage and terminological assumptions and things like that. Because when we say context, most people think, oh, the canonical context, like what's in the Bible next to this particular passage, right? Context is way bigger than that. It actually involves the geography, the material culture, the historical happenings, the compositional history, the author, the language, all of that stuff. And most importantly, what's called the cognitive environment of the authors. So we live in a cognitive environment defined by the 21st century, defined by America, et cetera. So if we're going to engage these texts, we have to think like ancient Israelites. Right? Just like if you were going to read a meme page, you would have to think like a Gen Z whatever thing. right? Otherwise, cars are cats, and it doesn't make any sense because you're not in the cognitive environment. right? So that's what uh, that means. All right. Now, I have the fire hose of information ready to go on this next part. But before we get into, OK, here's the canonical context, here's all this other stuff, is there any question about the sort of methodological discussion that, that I'm having right here? Yes, Sam? Uh, it feels like you've kind of brushed aside a definition of genocide, or competing definitions of genocide. but. Insofar as it's one of our three premises, yes. it is important to have a definition right. even if we don't want to split hairs. Yes. Very good point. So this, this is what I would get at. I think that most people have a sort of functional definition of genocide, which is mass slaughtering of a lot of people uh, because of who they are. Is that kind of what you all would agree with? OK. Here's the reason why that's not good. The UN does not put a magnitude on the number of genocide. The Rwandan genocide was a genocide, even though it was just in the thou just ugh, just in the thousands of casualties, right? Compared to the Holocaust, which was of course in the millions. But that doesn't make the Holocaust more of a genocide because it doesn't matter about the magnitude. In fact, if you go on Wikipedia, you can find a list of genocides. One of the, the smallest genocides uh, there was like 40 people because it was one tribe of uh, American Indians. They were the last ones left. And then they were killed. And it was only 40 of them. So that's part of the reason why I don't think it's helpful, because you have to do two steps. You have to first say, no, your sort of like cultural understanding of genocide doesn't match the UN definition. And secondly, the UN definition doesn't match this thing that's over in the ancient world. And I just don't, that is way too much effort. I think it's better to just say, OK, take however you understand the word genocide, and I'm going to articulate it in the words uh, that address the concern without using that label. For example, ethnic annihilation, mass slaughter, things like that. Okay. Okay. That so that's, that's why I don't use that, because I think it's rules lowering about labels is not a good time. Yes, Mr. Pope. Would it be accurate to say that instead of trying to impose the definitions of genocide, you're more trying to see if what happened in the Bible meets the spirit of genocide, that sort of Perhaps. But it's actually more than that. Because remember, we're not even evaluating that. We're just trying to understand what did the people who wrote the Bible and the people that participated in this warfare, what did they think they were doing in their own terms? Then we can say, do those terms match onto our terms? And I'm going to argue they don't. OK. Is everyone ready for a fire hose of information? Is this, you probably think this has been a fire hose information. It's about to get worse, don't worry. OK, I'm going to buzz through this. All right, I'm going to do, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly for the sake of time. This is mostly don't follow all the data points, just get the general trends, OK? And then at the end, we can circle back and discuss in detail, all right? So here's what the issue is. Here's the canonical context. So we read 
um, that Joshua, uh, we, we said that Joshua struck all down in the, in the land, show, leave alive nothing but breathes, right? Look at these passages here. Joshua uh, and uh, the Israelites finished inflicting a very great, uh, great slaughter on them until they were wiped out. And when survivors had entered the fortified towns, all the people returned, returned safe to Joshua at the camp of Makeda. I hope you've noticed it. I've color-coded it. They were wiped out, and there were survivors. Second verse, Joshua 11. Joshua took all their kings, struck them down, put them to death. Immediately followed by Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Okay? And... Uh, Joshua 13 uh, ends, Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years, and very much of the land still re uh, remains to be possessed. The book of Judges immediately follows Joshua, and it starts out, the very first verse, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquired, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites? I hope you're seeing the conflicting picture here. Were they wiped out, or were there survivors? Did he take the land all at one time, uh, or um, were there still Canaanites after him? Did he take it all? Did he apportion it? Complicated, right? So, sit with that for a second. Okay. Now, there are two ways we can look at that, about this. Oh, no, the Bible contradicts itself. Bible not true, right? That seems to be too easy. Why? Because we haven't asked the question, what did these ancient authors think they were writing? Like, what did they think they were doing? Do you think they can look at two sentences that contradict each other? This is the same level of silliness as people who read... Uh, answer not a fool according to his folly. Answer a fool according to his folly. Right next to each other and think, oh, the Proverbs guy, he was an idiot. He had two contradictory statements. It's like, no, that's part of how Proverbs work. If you read any other Proverbs, you'll see that style. And here, if you read any other ancient conquest account, you'll see the same thing. So Joshua in general, but 10 through 11 specifically, is a genre known as an ancient conquest account that has these five features. I'm going to focus on two and three, the language of annihilation and language of hyperbole, because the entailment is that this language is actually non-literal. And you may think, oh, that's cope. OK. Here's Pharaoh Merneptah in 1208 BC, saying, Yanoam is made as that which does not exist. Israel is laid waste. His seed is not. 1208 BC, a full 200 years before Israel's uh, uh, monarchy was established. Here's Ramesses III, another Egyptian. I slew the Dinian in their, uh, in their islands, while the Jecker and the Philistines were made ashes, the Weshes of the sea were made non-existent, uh, and I settled them in strongholds bound in my name as slaves. I annihilated them, and then I enslaved them. Here's another Egyptian, Tutmosis III. The numerous army of the Mechim was overthrown within an hour and perished as those who have never been in the manner of consuming flame. And this society continued to live much long after that. OK, you're saying, oh, that's Egyptians. All right, here's Assyrian, Sennacherib. In the course of my campaign, um, I received Nabu Bel Shumite, governor of the city of Harat, gold, silver, etc. The warriors of Hirame, wicked enemies, I cut them down with the sword. No one escaped. Many people escaped. Here's uh, a very important one. We're going to come back to this. This is the uh, Mesha. This is King Mesha um, of Moab. Moab was a neighbor of uh, Israel. We're going to come back to this because there's a lot of fascinating information here. But I just want to focus here in this, where he says, Omri, king of Israel, oppressed Moab. We went to war with them. Israel was destroyed forever. They were not, right? So you can just say, OK, all these ancient guys were weird. Or you can just take the fact, OK, that's how they talked. They, just, they, they did that all the time. Let's talk about hyperbole, for example. Uh, I've got a short example here. So this is uh, the annals of uh, Tiglath-Pileser. Uh, He's an Assyrian. He says here, uh, with the help of Asher, my lord, Asher is his god, um, uh, I marched the country from Suhi to the city of Carchemish uh, in the land of Hatti. I raided in one day. Now, I know that we're a bit rusty on our ancient geography. So Suhi to Carchemish is approximately Iraq to um, northern Syria, which I just looked this up on Google Maps. And that is 281 miles. And if you walk, it takes you 102 hours, or about five, four or five days. Okay, four or five days on foot, and he raided that whole country. That exactly. If you nonstop walk, and he raided that entire land in a single day while fighting. And the Book of Joshua does this. I see your hand. I'll come back to you. The Book of Joshua does this same thing. Joshua 10, it says Joshua came down on them suddenly, having marched all the way up from Gilgal. He inflicted a great slaughter on them at Gibeon, went, um, chased them by the, uh, the ascent of Beth Horon, struck them down as far as Azekah uh, and Makeda. Again, I know we're a little rusty on our geography, but 
that is about 50 miles that he did in one day. With elevation changes, I don't know if you can see that, he starts in the valley next to the Dead Sea and goes all the way up to like the second highest point in the entire land. And he covers all of that in a single night. 50, 56 miles, which if you're walking nonstop today would be about 21 hours. And he did that all in a single day. So that is an example of that. So here's the conclusion from uh, Kenneth Kitchen, who says, the narratives of Joshua describe an entry from Jordan, a full destruction of only two minor cities, Jericho and Ai, defeat of local kings and raids throughout South Canaan. Towns are attacked, they're taken, they're damaged. The kings and the subjects are killed. Like, let's not whitewash this. There's still a lot of violence, right? They're left behind, but they're not held onto. And the same in the North Campaign. Uh, Hatsor is the only city destroyed, but no other cities are destroyed. These uh, preliminary successes were celebrated with war rhetoric appropriate to the time, which should not be twisted to mean what it does not. In our case, we should not take this annihilation language and this hyperbolic language and twist it to say that this was an absolute ethnic annihilation of every Canaanite in the land. Okay. A lot of information. Fire hose off. Jet had a comment. I am mildly interested in your comment. Okay. All right. Self-censor. I'll take it. Yes, Mr. Pruitt. So could we say that the, uh, you could call it propaganda, uh, the sort of hyperbole that's being used by, say, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and everyone else, could we say that that is a sort of dishonesty that really shouldn't be included in scripture? This is a very good question, yes. I think this is a very good question, and this is where I'm going to break my rule earlier about context and use modern examples of this. All right. I don't know how many of you are sports fans. I love football. But if you go down to the MSC, you will see shirts that say, we own Bama. And the victory is like 24 to 28, and it was like three years ago. OK? Two years ago. Two years ago. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking, of the, I'm thinking of the one from 2012, OK? Since A&M has been in the SEC, we have played Bama like 12 times, 13 times, and won twice, both times by a point margin of less than a full touchdown. And yet, you can go buy shirts that say, we own Bama. <laughs> is that deceptive? No, because we own Bama. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. OK, but I think you can also reckon, or how about this? Here's another one. Think about the genre, OK. Think about, think about a genre in sports between two different types of videos. OK, Jimbo Fisher uh, is going to hopefully review tape and point out the errors that happen in our offense, right? Or any coach. They review tape, they scrutinize, and it's supposed to be a play-by-play, -play, literally play-by-play, -play, you know, very specific, literal, if you will. Do you include every play in a, high, in a highlights reel? Do you include every play in a hype video? What kind of hype video would show, I don't know, your quarterback getting sacked, and then the ball is run back for a touchdown? And while the... While, while, yeah, exactly, yeah. While like Kanye's power is playing in the background, right? No, they don't do that anymore. Oh, sorry, yeah, Kanye's canceled. Sorry, but, right. But you see what my point is, right? Like you already do this exact type of distinction. You recognize that a hype video is not the same genre, genre, if you will, as a highlights reel or um, a recap of the game or anything like that, it serves a specific purpose. Now, is it deceptive? And the answer is no, because guess what you can't do in a hype video? You cannot invent plays, right? I mean, AI is getting close, but you can't just invent footage. You can only take the footage that you have that is from the actual game, and then you take that and put it together to make a particular narrative. That is exactly what all of these kings do. Ramesses III had a battle with the Sea Peoples, the ones that I read at the front, where it says, I made them non-existent. He got absolutely rocked by that. Massive casualties. Egypt barely survived. This was like a 21-20 victory, if you will. And he said, I own the Sea Peoples. Does that make sense? Does that help? So that, it's not inherently deceptive. I saw a hand over here somewhere. J Julie? So would you also need to interpret God's actual Yes. Right. Jimbo Fisher says, go annihilate Bama. Same kind of or thing. Or at least the recording of the command. Right. In, in, in that kind of way. Yes, they would need to be understood that way. In the interest of time, we can circle back. There's a lot more in there, because when we talk about those commands, this, ooh, OK. 
Let me drop a spicy nugget and then I'm going to move on. Okay? <laughs> Deuteronomy and Joshua were not written contemporaneous with the events that they're describing. And they're shaped by a later context where those authors were very much reflecting on the past conquest in a different way. And those commands at that time had a different meaning. Yes, you had a hand. So, what, what is the intention of the, of the, um, of the authors here using this language? Um, celebration, I think, is, is kind of how that would be. It, we, we, won, we won the war, and Joshua's awesome, and Yahweh's awesome, and here's an ancient conquest account, just like the kings around us, right? Like, so, for example, um, Right, yeah. So, like, Tig, um, Tiglath Pileser here, he says, with the help of Asher, my lord, right? Like, it's glory to Asher, his god. Um, and with Moa, uh, uh, Mesha here, the purple is all the references to his god, Chemosh. So, this stela is celebrating Mesha and um, uh, the king Mesha and uh, Chemosh. And it's the same type of literature that the Israelites are doing, but they're celebrating Joshua and his god, Yahweh. Okay. We are running very tight on time, so. All right, Katie, yes, very quickly. When I was like growing up and learning and reading some of this stuff, something that was told to me a lot as a kid was, well, part of the reason Israel had so many problems like with immorality and so on and so forth is that they didn't do what God commanded and actually wipe out everyone. And it seems like sometimes there are parts where the Bible hints back, like if yeah. you had done what I said, you wouldn't be having these problems. How do you address right. that? Or yes, so very good point, and that's, oh man, okay. Payoff is very quick. That was what I was talking about. When these texts were written, most likely, when they read, sorry, okay, let me make a quick clarification for everybody. There's a difference between a text as written originally and when a text reaches its final form, okay? I'm sure all of you know this with your essays, you have early drafts, late drafts, et cetera. The book of Deuteronomy, most likely, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for this, most likely reached its final form, like the final version that we have in our Bible, during the reign of Josiah in 600 BC. And Josiah was a reforming king at a time when Israel was in mass apostasy, like you were saying, crazy apostasy. This was, um, just after Elijah had said, oh God, is there anybody on, in this land that still worships Yahweh, right? Massive apostasy. That, and so there's this reference where Josiah is the king, he's uh, in the temple, and, or no, it's actually the priest that finds it, it doesn't matter. But they find, there's a reference, you can read this in 1 Kings, they find a book of the scroll, of the law. It's, and that is what they read before all the people. And it's widely understood that that was, that scroll be, later became what we know as Deuteronomy, okay? So in the context where the final form of this book is being written at a time of massive apostasy due to intermarriage and intermingling and being led astray by the Canaanites, that is the reflection on which the editors were looking at the book of Deuteronomy and saying, okay, do you see all of these references to you know, separate from these people? So even though the original command was probably, I think, a lot more mild, it took on that heightened intensity later to the point where those editors were actually like saying, no, this is like, you really need to set everything aside, you really need to divide uh, apart. And it's true, if they had annihilated everybody, then it probably wouldn't be a problem. But that's not a justification for it, that's just more reflection on the past. I know that's extremely controversial, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Are you saying Moses didn't write Joshua? Did he write Joshua? Moses wrote Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> Most, okay. Here, here, here are my evangelical conservative Christian credits. Yes, I believe that Moses wrote Deuteronomy and, and the rest of the Pentateuch. I do believe that. But probably in a much more nuanced way than he wrote literally every single word, including his own death. We can talk about that later. Okay. In the interest of time, okay, I'm going to do this very, very quickly. Let me be clever here. Okay. So that's what, basically what we just talked about there was what the conquest wasn't. It was not this massive ethnic annihilation. So what was it? Two things. Judgment on the people of the land, and it was a divine land grant from God. There's one, ver there's, again, tons of verses to make this point. Here's one that illustrates both of them. God says, not because of your righteousness, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is dispossessing them before you to fulfill the promise that the Lord made on oath to your ancestors. God says to Abraham, I'll give you a land. That, land, that promise is now coming to fulfillment. Okay, this itself is how, this is also gonna be a little, might be a little dicey, we'll see. 
This is basically how the entire ancient world thought about warfare and about their nations. That their god was the god of the territory that they inhabited and had total reign over that. And any loss of territory, for example, an invasion, was a defeat of that god. All right? I'm going to give you an example from the book of Judges. So long story short, if you look right here, um, if you can see the, uh, the Ammonites on the far right there, the Ammonites, you see that line that goes down on the right side? So that's the border at the time of the Judges, or at the time of Joshua. That's the border of the land of, of the Israelites. Okay, and the Ammonites are to the west of that, east of that, sorry, to the east of that. And they invade west and they cross the border. And this causes a problem that Jephthah is one of the judges. He is appointed and he says, hey, Ammonites are crossing our border. This is a problem. And he says, not a problem. I will handle it diplomatically. I will send them a letter. The context, uh, the content of that letter is found in Judges 11. And I will summarize very quickly. I have the full text on the back because I think it's very important. But um, to summarize very quickly, he says, um, what are you doing in our land? And the Ammonites said, it's not your land, it's our land. And then Jephthah says, no, you're misunderstanding. Here's what happened. We came from Egypt. We came up to the land of Edom, and we said to Edom, so that's Edom down there in the far south, if you're following along. We said to Edom, hey, we're headed to this land, Canaan. Will you let us pass along the king's highway? Edom said no. And so they said, fine. So they, we went around, and we camped uh, at this river. You can see the river there. There we stayed for a while. Then we came to the land of Moab, and we asked the Moabites, will you let us through? And they said, no. So we went along on the other side, and we came to this part where we're inhabited right now that you claim is yours, and we came to Sihon, king of the Amorites, not the Ammonites, but the Amorites, and said, hey, can we pass through? No, no, don't want any trouble. We just want to pass through. And Sihon said, no, and I'm going to kill you. So Sihon, king of the Amorites, came out against us and fought against us, but our God, Yahweh, fought for us, and we slew him and his people and took his land. And now you are trying to come into this land that previously belonged to Sihon and claim it for yourselves. And the climax of Jephthah's argument is, the Lord God of Israel has conquered the Amorites for the benefit of his people Israel. Do you intend to take their place? It's a nice subtle threat. Should you not possess what your God, Chemosh, gives to you, and should we not possess everything that the Lord our God has conquered for our benefit? See that? The logic here is completely ancient. No analog at all to today. Chemosh is God of this land. He's granted it to the Ammonites. Yahweh's God of this land. He's granted it to the Israelites. If you come into this land, you're fighting against Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh already destroyed Sihon. Do you really want to try it? Spoiler, he tried it. And it didn't work out. Okay? Okay. So that is the underlying logic, and that is how literally every single border dispute in the Levant here in this region was handled. And that is why it's very misleading to call it genocide for, for that reason. Does that make sense? Is anyone spooked? I am spooked that you are currently messaging in the Slack. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. All right. Yes, I know. So let me be extremely fast. Man, we don't have till 9.50, I don't think. OK, I'm going to be extremely fast here. OK, here's the results of context, all right? So we're going to modify four. The Bible recounts a conventional territorial mil military campaign in a hyperbolic ancient conquest account, not in an ethnic annihilation, OK? Last toolbox is retrieval. I'll be very quick here. OK, there are two guys here to talk about. Basically, this argument has been happening since 145 AD. That's how old it is, all right? And there are two guys that have contributed a lot, Augustine and Oregon. Oregon says, you're misunderstanding the text. This is an allegory. The seven nations of Canaan, that's the seven sins of your heart. Joshua, that's Jesus. Let Jesus into your heart and drive the sin out. That's his point. Augustine, he says, no, uh, this was a literal thing that happened. I mean, you can read it allegorically, but it did actually happen. And what fundamentally happened is God has the prerogative to execute justice on whomever he will and however he will. He executed judgment on these people that were wicked. They were killing babies. They were committing bestiality, incest, all kinds of crazy things. He executed judgment using Joshua as his appointed leader. And whatever God commands is obligatory. Okay? And so Augustine, Oregon, we said earlier, uh, he said, 
um, if we don't use allegory, then people might believe unjust and savage things about God. Well, Augustine counters and says, if um, we change the uh, authority, or sorry, if we change scripture to only fit those things that we find palatable, we are not subjecting ourselves to scripture, but we're subjecting scripture to ourselves and becoming an authority over it. So these are two kind of tensions that, has, uh, that have to be managed. So how do we sort of break this tension? So I have a long quote, but I think it's really good, and I promise that this will, this will wrap up. So Augustine sketches out, okay, we've already decided it's not as bad as it seems, like the violence isn't all that terrible, but we still have to figure out why did God allow this to happen then and not happen now. And so here's the summary. So this is from a great book. This is from resource number uh, two, Making Sense of Old Testament Genocide. Um, Augustine briefly sketches out a hermeneutic of progressive revelation and spiritual fulfillment. Whatever stipulations Christians of today do not observe from the books of the Old Testament were nonetheless appropriately commanded at that time and for that people, and that the things that we do not observe signified things that we understand and, are, uh, and hold in a spiritual sense. Furthermore, argues Augustine, a change in covenant stipulations is exactly, or sorry, entirely unsurprising and unproblematic since a new covenant had been predicted in the Old Testament itself. Finally, sinful humanity is hardly in a position to criticize this change of precepts. For Augustine uses this analogy saying, a sick person ought not criticize medical knowledge if it prescribes one thing for him today and another tomorrow, while it also forbids what it had earlier prescribed. For that is the way that it is with the healing of the body. This concept of accommodation is extremely powerful and helps us understand things like slavery as well. Why on earth is there slavery in there? Similar to how there was war everywhere and killing everywhere, every labor system was organized by slavery. God, at that time, permitted those people to participate in that system, highly regulated, oriented towards an ultimate uh, redemption of those systems. They weren't, meant, they weren't sanctioned and said, these are good and they need to stay here for all time. It's, okay, we're going to allow this temporarily, but ultimately move towards redemption and destruction. And so what we can retrieve from the past is that uh, the Bible is true in a literal and an allegorical sense. So those of us that are Christians can actually read this allegorically. We don't need to deny the literal sense. Augustine didn't deny the allegorical sense. You can have both. If you've ever sang the song, Oh, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, it's an allegorical retelling of the book of Numbers and the book of Joshua. So you can have both. Um, and you can say that the spiritual sort of nourishment comes from the allegorical sense, not from the literal sense. So you don't need to relish in that violence. Um, uh, second, we can say that human-initiated warfare can be unjust and it should be critically evaluated. And some Christians would even go so far as to say, God alone can execute violence and in Jesus has removed the sword from people. They would be called pacifists. Not everybody goes that far. But divinely-initiated warfare is obligatory and it's limited. We've already talked about number four and number five is what I've added here, which is accommodation. And that is that God accommodates broken sinful humans to bring about the good of redemption through them. And then I want to conclude on this image. I want you to meditate on this for a bit. This is the picture of how Jesus conquers. Because we talk about how Joshua conquers, but the way that Jesus conquers isn't through the blood of the enemies, but it's through the blood of the lamb. They, they all the nasty beasts of Revelation, shall make war with the lamb, but the lamb shall conquer, not through violence of force, but through his own uh, shed blood. So that's my concluding remark there. Any comments? I will say that took a lot longer than I had practiced. We haven't been kicked out yet, so I will take one question. Yes, Landry. What is your favorite item from the appendices? The appendices? The appendices from your slides. Oh, I was going to go the marriage of Aragorn and Arwen, but different, different appendices. Um, here is here's my favorite, right here. That there is actually hope. There are beautiful pictures of hope in this conquest account that even though there are people who were in the land, they still uh, were saved and brought about through salvation. So Rahab is like the classic example. There's, in fact, more words are spent in the book of Joshua on the salvation of Rahab than the destruction of Jericho family. and her family and her children and her offspring. Yes. But there's also a fun little piece here in Judges 121 uh, where there's a guy that's like leaving the city and he sees the Israelites and he says, you're going to take over the city, aren't you? And they said, yep. And they said, okay, 
there's the entrance, can I leave? And they let him go. And he leaves and he builds a city. Caleb the Kenizzite, the city of Shechem, Uriah the Hittite, and Shamgar ben Anat are all incorporated into the, they all seem to be Yahwehist. So it, it's not all doom and gloom. There's actually hope in there. Okay, we do seriously need to cut. All right, thank you. We're, those of you that want to stick around, I will stick around for a few minutes until we're kicked out. Uh, and the rest of us will go to the little Chick-fil-A area and kind of hang out there. So I really appreciate your time. I, the late start and everything. So thank you. <laughs>